All right, so um, welcome. My name is uh, Jeannie Kildee. I'm the director of the Religious Studies Program at the University of Minnesota. And it is my enormous pleasure to uh, be involved in this show and to welcome you all here to share it with us. Um, I hope you're in, enjoying the exhibit. If you haven't had a chance to, to see it um, after the talk, uh, be sure that you look in the gallery and down this wall as well to see all of the amazing photographs um, that have been uh, taken by our photographers who's at the back right now, uh, John Lewis. Uh, and just if I had three hands, Two more hands, I would clap, but thank you, John. This is amazing. Uh, and and it, it provides such a great opportunity to get uh, two communities together whose histories have intertwined uh, over the years, Jewish community and black community here in North Minneapolis. And it's such an amazing way to bridge uh, those two communities. So we're so glad to put this on. Just a couple of housekeeping things. If you're looking for a restroom, go out to the left and then there's a, a, a hallway uh, and you'll find the restrooms down that hallway. Uh, we will have a reception after the talk and everybody is very welcome to join us with some light refreshments. There's a lot of thank yous that I have to uh, I go through that I'm actually don't have to. I'm very delighted to go through. We've had a lot of help with this. Um, first of all, from the Yurok folks, including James here, James. Uh, front office people, um, Antoinetta and uh, Leah and Geneva have just done a great deal of work on this and we so appreciate it. Um, we also uh, have to thank uh, our, um, our various sponsors and co-sponsors, which are all listed in your program if you have any questions about sponsors and co-sponsors. But this, this uh, event was funded in part by a grant from the Imagine Fund, which is a fund at the University of Minnesota. Um, they've put up the lion's share of the money, but then many departments and units at the University of Minnesota also contributed to just to show how important and how interested everybody has been in this, um, in this event. Amongst those, uh, amongst our sponsoring organizations, um, and just a couple I want to point out here is the Department of African and African American Studies. Uh, and uh, Vanessa, who will be talking with us tomorrow, Vanessa Steele is here uh, as a representative of that department. Um, also, the um, Heritage Studies and Public History Program, uh, Greg D'Onofrio is in the back here uh, from that department, the Art History Department, the History Department, uh, Jewish Studies, Natan Paradise is in the back here. Uh, representing Jewish studies, just really helpful in, um, in helping us mount this, this um, exhibit here. The Northwest Architectural Archives, the, um, uh, uh, the uh, Nathan and Teresa Berman Upper Midwest Jewish Archives, all were involved in this. Uh, and as you can see, the list really goes on. Um, and so we're just delighted to be able to do that. But of course, um, our main, not really a co-sponsor, but our partner in this project has been the first uh, Church of God in Christ, uh, which uh, is in this building now. And um, we will hear more from um, Pastor Webster in a minute or two. I want, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn the mic over to you in just a few minutes. <laughs> um, uh, but before we get to that, actually, let's do it now. What the heck? Thank you, Jeannie, and certainly I don't want to be too redundant, but I do want to take the opportunity to thank each of you for being uh, committed to the facility, the building that we have a shared heritage with, and so I thank God for your contributions, certainly uh, not to re re reiterate too much, but to Marilyn Rolfe and to the various sponsors, and dare I not thank again the chairman of our board of trustees, the photographer, Deacon Lewis. Come on, let's thank God for <laughs> Also very thankful. We've got a couple, um, what we call in our Reformation church mothers that have been responsible uh, to be a part of the work of First Church of God in Christ over the years. We have Mother Scott in that pretty neon shirt there, and Mother Bassell, who both have contributed to the work of First Church for many, many years. And so we might thank God for them as well. I think we're in for an exciting, exciting time together uh, to be able to share together, break bread together. 
and to hear the stories on how our shared faith yet lives on today and how we got, and I'll just sing his praises, how we got Bishop Lemuel Thuston to come to Minnesota. He's the chairman of our general assembly. So he'd be almost equivalent to the Pope in the Catholicism. <laughs> so I don't know how we got him. Uh, we took, we kind of just took a chance and we got him. He's a great historian. He's going to really share why or and how the people would have migrated from Oklahoma up into the Twin Cities and some things that have happened historically as a result of that. But thank you again for the opportunity to share in this most historic opportunity. And it's our uh, um, um, uh, commitment to you all that we're going to continue to keep what we now call First Church of God in Christ as a holy temple in the north side of Minneapolis and continue to serve even marginalized communities. So God bless you and thank you for this time. Oh, thank you, Pastor Webster. Um, so I, just a, br a brief uh, little introduction to um, how this project got started. Uh, in, the, I think it was the summer of 2018, uh, Marilyn Chayat, who will be talking with us tomorrow, um, uh, and I have been working on a project called the Houses of Worship Project, documenting uh, churches and synagogues in the Twin Cities um, from its, the beginnings of the Twin Cities in, in uh, 19, 1849 until 1924. And as we were documenting them, Marilyn was focusing on North Minneapolis and in you know, uh, requesting um, tours of, of the various buildings there and, and calling up the um, the congregations, the pastors, and so forth, and asking if we could take a look inside the building. So um, one day that summer, we went into First Church of God in Christ for the very for first time for me. I know Marilyn had been there when she was younger, um, uh, but first time for me, and I was astounded. I was I absolutely. I've been in a lot of churches um, uh, in a lot of synagogues. I was astounded at the at the painting, the quality of the painting, and that it was still there in Minneapolis after all these years. That's what's that's what's remarkable um, is that this building is is there that it has been so carefully stewarded by the by the congregation that bought it um, it was built in 1926 as a synagogue as you know to Fareth B'nai Jacob um, in 1957 it was bought by the first church of God in Christ Graham Temple um, uh, and um, that congregation has just stewarded it so carefully over the years we met at that time um, uh, the late pastor Horace Hughes, who was very enthusiastic about the building. We had wonderful conversations with him about the building, and he was just amazed that we found it interesting. Um, uh, we then uh, started conversations about trying to nominate this building to the National Register of Historic Places, and ultimately formed a partnership with the Church, Church of God in Christ um, to do so. Uh, we brought on um, uh, Deacon Lewis, who was very important in uh, this nomination process, and then Rolf Anderson, a his who's right here, Rolf, uh, who's a historic preservationist, who helped as well. We received a uh, a Minnesota legacy grant to uh, start the process. Um, and we uh, achieved the first hurdle, even though we did most of the research during COVID, during the pandemic, um, which, was, which was amazing. We've recently received a second, uh, we've, so we've made the state hurdle, basically. We've received a second legacy grant now to start on the national nomination. We will be working on that this summer in the fall. Uh, and um, I know we, we've uh, talked to many people now about doing oral histories, and I know Deacon Lewis is going to be doing several oral histories for that. Um, so we'll be working on that through the summer and the fall and, and um, submitting that nomination sometime early next year. Uh, and uh, that'll be the that'll that'll be it. Our fingers will be crossed that it it is it does achieve um, the register. So that's the plan for this building. In the meantime, though, um, uh, this building deserves to be on the list for a variety of reasons. It's uh, just the, the the amazing artwork, the original um, uh, uh, um, condition of the artwork, but also because it's it. It functions, it's a window, it's a witness, it's testimony to two important communities that live side by side in the Twin Cities in North Minneapolis, two marginalized communities who lived in North Minneapolis because they were redlined out of other areas in the city, um, and who lived side by side, who worked, who worshiped, um, uh, who had businesses together, 
um, and, and both of whom suffered by uh, starting as early as the late 1930s and into the 1950s and into the 1970s by the various urban development processes that wiped out many parts of the community. Uh, and so this is this building, the, just the fact that this landmark building still stands is, some, is somewhat remarkable uh, in an area that's been so devastated by public policy. And so this building is a testimony to those two uh, groups and their intertwined histories. And that's what we really uh, have envisioned the goal for today's event and tomorrow's symposium is to, to be able to discuss together, to, to share stories about those intertwined histories in, uh, in this region, in this, in this neighborhood. With that, I think I will um, turn it over to our, uh, our speaker. And our, we have with us today to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Stephen Ostro from the Art History Department at the University of Minnesota. So Stephen. Good afternoon. You can hear me. Yes. Okay. You can do it. Yes. I'll just my voice. I think it's all coming to my face. <laughs> okay. All right. Good afternoon. It's a, a pleasure to be here and to introduce our speaker, Samuel Gruber. Hold it up closer, please. You bet. Okay. I, I, your mouth. Yes. I hate microphones. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our speaker. Samuel Gruber received his BA in medieval studies from Princeton University, and then his MA, MPhil, and PhD from Columbia University in New York uh, with degrees in art history and archeology span with a specialty in the history of architecture. He is a recipient of the Rome Prize, um, a fellow of the American Academy in Rome and has received numerous re research grants and has participated in countless grant funded team projects. He is, by any definition, an accomplished researcher, author, curator, consultant, and teacher, the founder and managing director of Gruber Heritage Global, which is a cultural resources consulting firm. Dr. Gruber has taught in the Jewish Studies program in Syracuse University and has given courses, among others, at Binghamton, Colgate, Columbia, Cornell, and Temple Universities, as well as Lemoyne College where he has taught medieval Renaissance and Baroque Jewish art and architecture. And I have to add to this, the history of plastics as well, which of course fits in perfectly. <laughs> um, since 2019, Sam has also been teaching summer courses on medieval art, architecture and urbanism for the Art Workshop International in Assisi, Italy. I think we'd all like to participate in that. For more than 20 years, he has been a leader in the documentation, protection, preservation, and presentation of Jewish cultural heritage sites all around the world. He's written two books on synagogue architecture, the first of 1999, entitled Simply Synagogues, and then a volume of 20, 2003, entitled American Synagogues, A Century of Architecture in Jewish Community. He's also written numerous articles, chapters, and conference papers. In 1990, he organized the first international conference on the preservation of historic and cultural Jewish sites and curated an accompanying exhibition entitled The Future of Jewish Monuments. And then he served as chair or co-chair and member of organizing committee for follow-up conferences in Paris, Prague, as well as Bratislava. Dr. Gruber served for over a decade uh, as a research director of the US Commission for the Preservation of America's Heritage Abroad, for which he planned and supervised more than a dozen major countrywide surveys of cultural heritage sites. As founding director of the Jewish Heritage, heritage Council of the World Monuments Fund, and subsequently as consultant to the WMF, he has planned and oversaw historic preservation project projects in over a dozen countries 
which all in have entailed extensive documentation, planning, and restoration projects. Finally, on a purely personal note, I want to just say that it was truly a pleasure to visit the synagogue slash church with the experts, with Marilyn Chayat, who you'll hear from tomorrow, but especially Sam, to see this monument through their eyes and to learn so much about it. So thank you. Please welcome Dr. Gruber. Okay, I need to can we set this up. All right, while we're getting set up with the PowerPoint, thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone, for organizing this conference. Thank you for the uh, congregation for making the church so accessible. Uh, thank you, John, for the fantastic photographs. And mine are not going to compare, but uh, when you see my slides in this talk, you'll want to rush out and take a closer look in the pictures outside. Um, I was thinking when the when the pastor was speaking and also when Jeannie was speaking, uh, I'm uh, another hat that I wear is I'm president of the Arts and Crafts Society of Central New York. Central New York is where Gustav Stickley was based and uh, Adelaide Robineau, a lot of great uh, craftspeople of the early 20th century. And, and I was giving a walking tour on Saturday, last Saturday afternoon. And uh, we were looking at this fantastic, wonderful house designed by a, a very prominent architect. And the owner of the house, uh, was kind enough to come and speak to us about uh, the more than 50 years that she and her family have lived there. And she said to me, you know, you keep calling, this is called the Applebee House, because that's what it was called when it was first designed. And she said, but Applebee, the Applebee's only lived here for less than two years. Uh, my family's been here for more than 50 years. Uh, and I said, okay, the, the family name is Patrician, appropriately. And I said, we'll, we'll start calling it the Patrician House. And I think th that's a good, a good thing to remember when we're talking about this synagogue and church. Remember, the congregation at TBJ was only in this building for about 30 years. And the church, the first uh, church of, of God and Christ, has been there, by my calculation, for about 65 years. That's more than twice the length. Um, so it's in the, the history, it's a dual history, uh, but this is, this, is, um, this is a very important church that we're talking about, which has been uh, generous in protecting its history and the legacy of the Jewish community that was there before, uh, but has its own uh, very important role uh, that it's played uh, for more than half a century and continues to play in North Minneapolis. And we'll hear more about that tomorrow. And I'm looking forward to it. So uh, I'm going to speak today pretty much about the art in the synagogue and uh, where it fits in the world of Jewish art. Uh, and people immediately might say, Jewish art? I didn't know there was such a thing. Stop that. Stop that. There is Jewish art, and it's been around for millennia. It's just a lot of Jews deny it because they've been brainwashed by more recent uh, interpretations which have, which have denied uh, the presence of Jewish art. And that picks up on some 19th century ideas, almost anti-Jewish ideas, we call them uh, uh, anti-Semitic or, or racist, uh, about uh, that, that even denied that Jews were, were physically capable of making art. There was some, their, their books, there was something wrong with their optics, you know. They, they can read books, but they can't make art. Now, this is a lot of nonsense, and so we don't have to go into it. So just accept what you see, accept the evidence of archaeology, of history, of archival research, and then it may not be Caravaggio, which is what Steve is going to be lecturing about at the museum tomorrow, but it is, it is artistic expression of value and sometimes of great beauty, but always of great interest to us for understanding uh, a culture and its, its aspirations, its expressions. Um, and, and we'll look at a little bit of that going forward today. So the church, you know, um, it is uh, in this picture looking quite massive. It is a large building among the surviving buildings uh, on the north side. There are several other uh, large uh, former synagogues that are also churches. There's a nice sort of trio in the in the area, which might even make someday a, a, a broader National Register Historic District or a multiple property nomination. Uh, there is something maybe temple-like about its design. 
and it's not accidental. Uh, this was a very common uh, expression for synagogues from the late 19th and early 20th century, having a big central component, which is going to be a vestibule and a sanctuary, or essentially a, a large hall or a nave, um, but it's flanked by two uh, tower-like uh, wings, and they're supposed to resemble, or at least they are said to recall in much of the literature, the, 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 the columns on the Temple of Jerusalem, the Yaakim and Boaz, um, and, and uh, you know, are, are, are therefore symbolic of, of the Temple of Jerusalem. In fact, they're quite practical. The reason synagogues, urban synagogues, especially across America, had these towers is because that's where the stairways are so that women can enter the main doorway, but then turn off to the sides and go up to the gallery level above. Orthodox synagogues are separated uh, by gender, so women and men sat separately. And traditionally, in most of the buildings on restricted lots where uh, space was limited in American cities until after World War II, uh, women were upstairs and men were below. And we'll see how that's expressed architecturally inside in a minute. But it's no accident that, um, now I, I, you know, I framed this photo to give it this impressive uh, appearance, but it's no accident that the building looks uh, the way it does. Um, the zigzagging pattern um, on the facade, it's sort of an art deco type of decoration, but it's very common in all sorts of buildings in the 1920s, uh, commercial buildings, religious buildings, even residential buildings, you'll find it in apartment houses. Uh, it's a way of uh, incorporating beauty or at least a kind of visual stimulation uh, without, uh, without taking on much expense. It's a very cheap way to decorate a building, and some of our builders today could learn from uh, that for sure. Uh, just because it's a plain wall doesn't mean it has to be boring. Okay, so inside. Inside's really stupendous, as we've heard. Um, this is a very wide-angle lens, so there's a little bit more sweep uh, than you actually experience when you're there, but it's taken from the women's gallery up above, so if you'd gone up one of those uh, stair towers, you'd come out onto the gallery, and from here we look out across the men's section down below, and uh, there is seating um, facing the, uh, facing the uh, ark, or the aron, which is on the east wall in the traditional manner, which is here. Um, what we're going to be talking about are several decorative components that survive from the 1930s uh, painting uh, program. And that includes the ceiling with stars and clouds, um, the arc wall with curtains, uh, the arc itself, which is uh, somewhat reduced. There were some sculpted lions and some tablets of the law here, but they're painted vases with flowers and some urns on the top. And then um, some stenciling on the side, uh, sunburst patterns and other things under the windows. And then most importantly, I think to me and also to the team that's been working on the history are the series of zodiac signs, what we call mazoles in, in Jewish tradition. Um, and these, these designate the 12 uh, months of the year, the 12 zodiacs, uh, signs, uh, and we'll discuss what the significance of that is as we go forward. Uh, if you haven't heard the word, if you think you haven't heard the word mazolis, you're wrong. Most of you have heard the expression mazel tov. Mazel tov just means may you be under a good sign. Mazel is the zodiacal sign, the astrological sign, tov is good, and that is um, a, a, an expression of, of well-being. And that in itself suggests a kind of uh, uh, positive, even optimistic purpose of including zodiac signs within, within uh, even a religious space, a, a sanctuary of a synagogue. Okay. So here we're looking at the ceiling. You'll see it's blue with stars. Um, it's a cloudy uh, night. And we'll get back to that in a minute. And you see the sweep of the uh, zodiac signs across the parapet wall of the women's gallery. We read them from right to left as Hebrew is read. And it starts with the uh, first month of the year. And we'll get into this a little bit later. But the, in the Jewish calendar, there are many beginnings of the year. Uh, time is 
um, important, is essential in understanding uh, the cosmos in Judaism and also regulating the calendar <coughs> for the individual uh, and the performance of commandments to fulfill responsibilities to being uh, Jewish and part of a Jewish community. Um, there are many beginnings of the year. Uh, in this case, and in most synagogues, the beginning of the year is seen at the time of Rosh Hashanah, the first uh, of the, uh, the beginning of the liturgical calendar. But uh, Passover in the spring is also seen as the beginning of the year, and there are also other alternatives. But here we begin with, uh, it'll begin with um, a Libra, and it'll make its way over to Virgo. And those are the Latin terms, and uh, that, that, that's the course of the Jewish holiday season. Uh, here we see another view. This is from uh, what would have been the um, platform in front of the ark. Uh, it's now the, the pulpit area for the church and you can get a sense of the size and seating. Another view of from the gallery, and we'll be looking in a minute at some of the painted architecture uh, on the sides, walls there. All right, so um, there's some decoration. It's not intense decoration. It's not like going into the Sistine Chapel in Rome where everything is covered, uh, but there is a sense that that painted decoration enhances the the experience of a space, the value of, the, of a space, the meaning of a space. And this is something that we know Jews have uh, been involved in uh, from the beginning of synagogues uh, in the early, um, in the late Roman period. So synagogues, uh, they may, synagogues as we know them as physical places are first found in the first century BCE. And really we find them more from the third, fourth, fifth century on. Um, and in the 1930s, in the early 1930s, a synagogue was discovered in modern day Syria, right by the Euphrates River uh, in a town called Dori Europis. It was a border town. And uh, it, 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 it caused a sensation because when archeologists uncovered it, they, they found that all the walls were uh, painted with, with frescoes. And this is not the time to go into the meaning of Dori Europis, more books about have been written about this one site than any other work of Jewish art or architecture. Um, and it is likely if you've taken an art survey course in any university to be the only instance of Jewish art that you'll have ever seen. I know that was the case for me going through Princeton and Columbia. I never saw any Jewish art uh, in all the courses I took except for Dori Europis. Um, but it's not a one-off. We know from archaeology and we know from uh, textual sources that there was a lot of other artistic expression in Jewish communities in the early centuries of what we call the diaspora, that period when Jews are no longer centered uh, in Jerusalem, but have spread out uh, throughout the Greco-Roman world and even, even beyond. Um, but just to give you some indication of what the Dori Europa uh, frescoes are like, there are over 30 biblical stories or also including stories from the book of Esther that is about Mordecai and Esther and Haman and whatnot. Um, they're all mostly stories about divine deliverance of the Jews. Uh, and you see the hand of God here interceding with Moses uh, as he leads the children of Israel out of Egypt and this, the sea is split. Um, it's a very big painting, um, probably twice this size of this screen, and um, it's just one of many in this area. Um, we also know from archaeological discoveries that painting was common in many other Jewish contexts. In this case, it's one of the Jewish catacombs in Rome. There used to be six. We know of two today, and this is what we call a cubiculum, a little room, and in that cubiculum, there probably was a grave of an important person, maybe a rabbi, uh, or it could have just been a place where people would get together and say prayers um, uh, in memory of the dead uh, who were buried in uh, sort of tunnels around. And, um, uh, and here we see a representation of an ark, uh, similar, in fact, to the ark that is in um, uh, TBJ into, in the church. Uh, that we're looking at, and it's flanked by two big uh, menorahs uh, with their flames uh, burning, probably uh, signs of, of uh, perpetual life uh, or a hope for perpetual life. 
Uh, we'll get to it in a minute, but if you look carefully, you'll see there are curtains that are drawn around this scene. So not unlike the curtains we will see in a minute uh, on the uh, east wall of, of uh, 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 TVJ. Uh, here we have another example of a painted interior, just jumping ahead to show that in every age where we have synagogue remains, we know that there was painted decoration and often a lot of mosaic decoration in the floors as well. So the idea of a beautiful space uh, is, seems to be constant throughout most Jewish history. This is a synagogue in the Moravian town of Boscovice. Uh, I've just recorded a long lecture about this. If anyone wants to know more, you can find that link. <clears throat> but it was uh, entirely painted, but uh, the painting was covered over. It was whitewashed uh, probably in the 1930s and then uh, even more so after World War II. And only since the 1990s have all of the decorations been revealed. And this is that I, just one indication of the very, very intense decoration uh, of, the, of one portion of the ceiling. This is in the women's gallery. Um, this type of decoration continued uh, because of the Holocaust, though there's such destruction, and because of the Jewish reluctance to photograph synagogue interiors, particularly uh, when synagogues were in use, uh, we tend to have a lot of exterior pictures of old synagogues, but not too many interior ones. But wherever we can find uh, an old building that was a synagogue and begin to investigate it, we often find that underneath the whitewash there is paint. Um, this is an instance of one of the best preserved painted synagogues in Ukraine, in Lviv. It's called the Tsurigila Synagogue from the 1920s. We know quite a bit about uh, its decoration. Uh, the architect was a guy named Albert Kornbluth, and uh, the painters and the architect were trained to decorate theaters and other public places. Um, so this was a period where um, almost every uh, cafe, restaurant, theater, department store was likely to have very lively and lavish wall painting. And uh, the painters here are quite good, quite skilled. They're trained, we would call them maybe ac academic, uh, but they are commercial painters. And in this case, they are carrying out a <coughs> program that was probably dictated by the religious authorities, um, but it's quite expansive through uh, all of the uh, walls of the synagogue. And you can see even quite exotic in a few places with the inclusion of this parrot. Um, Keep this in mind, this is obviously quite different than what we're seeing here in Minneapolis. They're almost contemporary, uh, but uh, they're two sides of the same coin. It was a desire to embellish the sanctuary, carrying out a commandment from Exodus, which is called Chidor Mitzvah, which is to glorify the commandment, uh, making the holy beautiful. And that's the permission that artists and architects have needed to, to carry out their work for, for uh, generations, if not, if not millennia. Uh, I just threw this in just before people were coming because I was asked a question. Um, how about the Wilshire Boulevard Synagogue in Los Angeles? It is about the same time, it's the 1920s. And here too, the decoration is very lavish and somewhat different from uh, Sora Gilag in Ukraine. Um, in it, the painter Hugo Balin uh, created a long narrative history with uh, scores of human figures uh, in, in uh, dramatic scenes. And this chronicles the entire history of Judaism from Abraham until the arrival of Jews in America. And it is a, a, a movie like it, it unspools like a film. And of course, this, is, this, this was funded by the Warner Brothers. Uh, in Los Angeles, so that's appropriate. Now, Rabbi Magnin, who created the synagogue and, and, and was the patron of this work, was highly criticized in the 1920s for his um, generous provision of, the, of, of human form in this synagogue decoration. And he said, well, you know, we're in the 20th century. Visual culture today is what is what uh, written culture was in the past. Uh, there's no way that these scenes can be read as idolatrous. This is history. Uh, this is not uh, worship. And 
you know, he, and he, he strongly uh, defended the decision. Uh, just a few years later, really just a few years later, Dora Europus was discovered and Magnin was able to say, see, I told you so. Um, <laughs> and since then, we found many other instances of synagogue decoration that fill in the gaps in between, just a few of which I've shown you. So here is um, uh, just a few details from the Hugo Balin murals at Wilshire Boulevard Temple. Okay, now let's look at some of the pieces um, of the synagogue that we're concerned with uh, today. Um, <coughs> then the lights in the vault of the sky and give light on the earth. This is Genesis 15 um, about creation. And I think uh, that is part of the driving uh, force to include uh, representations of the sun, the moon, and the stars in synagogue interiors. And we have many instances of ceilings being painted this way. I should say churches also frequently have vaults of heaven. The dome is the vault of heaven. Um, and and in, in Judaism, we think of a vault as a, as a canopy, uh, ohel, uh, maybe a, a, a canopy of peace uh, or a canopy of um, time. But in this case, um, this is a flatter wooden roof and it is uh, painted uh, blue with stenciled stars and then uh, rough clouds along the edge. Uh, what we also see here, and it would have originally extended down here, it's been painted over uh, on this blue section between the curtains where they pull apart, uh, it would be a large sunburst. And the sunburst represents a God, obviously, um, in the beginning, well, there was light. Um, God, since antiquity, has been seen as uh, incorporeal, but uh, light uh, is, is sort of is his, his sign. And, uh, but it's also the sunrise, the sunrise on the starry sky. And of course, the synagogue comes to life in the morning when a minion, 10 men, would enter the synagogue. Uh, they might recite the Matovu prayer, uh, how goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and they're counting the words of that prayer. When they have all 10 men, they have all the 10 words, they can begin their service. And the Shakrit um, is the morning service, sort of before dawn, but awaiting for the dawn to come. And that is also appropriate here. Uh, we have this starry sky going back uh, centuries, and I've just a few examples. Uh, this is a medieval manuscript illumination from the 15th century in Italy, and it's just a room in a house. Um, that's the way synagogues were in many small Italian towns. It would be a townhouse and maybe a shop down below and a, and a meeting room, which serves as a synagogue up above. You can see the windows are black. It's still dark outside. The candles are burning. Uh, so this is the morning service, uh, unless it's a service during one of the holidays where one stays up all night and studies. Um, but if you look at the wooden ceiling with coffers, wooden coffers up above, you see stars. So it's, it's, it's an idea that is not new. It wasn't new in 1932 in Minneapolis. It probably wasn't even new in 1460 in uh, Reggio Emilia, in, in, in Emilia in, in Italy. Uh, another example, uh, which may have some bearing and Marilyn will talk about this tomorrow on uh, the synagogue here is an example from Botoshani in Romania, an amazing synagogue, big synagogue from the early 19th century. We don't know when it was painted though. The painting is probably substantially later and uh, possibly some of it is from the 20th century, uh, but it is uh, decorated with uh, a, a, a canopy, literally a canopy. It's as if you're in a tent and it's hanging there, and that canopy is um, is painted with stars. We also have the the uh, imperial, the Austrian-Hungarian eagle. Uh, uh, I think that's it's not the Russian; it's the Austrian Austrian eagle. I think up there, uh, Bodoshani was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. I think at that time, I need to check that. I'm not sure. Um, and then we have a series of other paintings, including zodiac uh, symbols, which will look at later. Um, in America, this transfers into a few of the immigrant synagogues that survive with their painting intact. And um, our example here in Minneapolis is one of just a few. 
I became aware of synagogue wall painting about 10 years ago when I was contacted by a group of people in Burlington, Vermont, who were uncovering a giant mural from a 1910 synagogue. Um, they knew it was there, but they couldn't save it uh, 30 years before when that building, former synagogue, was then turned into a, an apartment building. But they were able to persuade the owner of the building just to cover it up with a false wall. And in, 19, uh, in 2012, when the building changed owners, uh, they were able to persuade the new owner to let them look to see inside if the painting was still there. It was, although it had deteriorated a lot. And that started a long project, which has just reached its conclusion this, this year, over a decade later, with the complete restoration, the removal of the, build, of, of the mural entirely, and then its, its, its conservation restoration at uh, Ohavi Zedek Synagogue in, in Burlington. But at that time, I was called and they asked, is this, how unusual is this? What do we know about uh, synagogue wall painting in America? And I said, well, we don't know anything at all, in fact. So let's start looking. And so over the last 10 years, I've identified about 20 instances where we can uh, identify either through standing buildings, fragments of buildings, or photographs of interiors, which as I said, even in America are rare to find for Orthodox shuls, immigrant Orthodox shuls, um, but at least 20 instances where we have, uh, clearly there were wall paintings uh, uh, included in the decoration. Of these, only a handful survived, uh, and most have been, are in fragmentary condition, and we'll see a few examples. And there are two synagogues that boast terrific paintings still in very good condition. Both of those paintings have been lit, both of those buildings have been listed on the National Register of Historic Places, one in Providence, Rhode Island that you see here, and another in Chelsea, Massachusetts. And then there, I knew of one church in the Bronx, which we'll end this talk with looking at, uh, where the church has taken responsibility and uh, really feels that they are uh, stewards and, and kind of almost say Kaddish for the congregation that was once there and, there, and, they, and they value the paintings that are there, very different from ours here in Minneapolis. Um, and then when, and then a few years, two years, three years ago, Marilyn and Jeannie called me and said, we have an example in Minneapolis and come on out and take a look at it. it took me a while because of the pandemic. I only got here last December and I was you know, just thrilled to see them. So it's a very rare breed now, rare survivors, but uh, clearly I believe this was a very widespread tendency among immigrant, uh, uh, Eastern European immigrant Jews setting up uh, small synagogues initially, and then sometimes their second buildings in the 1920s and 30s. You've got your hand up. Yeah, sure. Now, did your research reveal any uh, Sephardic synagogues? Um, there, is one, there is one fragment of, uh, of wall painting that came from a Sephardi synagogue in the Lower East Side. The building has been torn down. The fragment is preserved in the uh, Kahila, um, uh, Kahila Kadosha Yanina Synagogue on Broom Street in, in New York. Uh, so, so we know that Sephardi synagogues also were painted, uh, although that painting is purely like a floral decorative design, which is not that different from the type of wall covering we find in both synagogues and churches through much of the 19th century. Um, prior to that, there were there are not a lot of Sephard, old Sephardi synagogues in America, and most of them, the Portuguese Spanish ones that go back to colonial periods like Sheriff Israel in New York or Mikveh Israel in Philadelphia, they had a totally different aesthetic. And, and so they did not generally have, uh, they're not part of the same narrative. They had Tiffany, you know, Sheriff Israel had wall decoration in New York done by Tiffany, by Louis Tiffany. So that was a different, different taste, different aesthetic, different budget entirely. Um, <laughs> but, but it's a good question and, and it needs more work. Um, so uh, this is, um, this is uh, Providence and I just want you to see the sky. Here it's more of a, a morning sky. There's more light, it's lighter and there's clouds, but it's the same, um, the same, I think, motivating uh, force. This is the Walnut Street Shul, Shul or Aguda Shalom in Chelsea, Massachusetts. Uh, I've been working with this congregation to 
repurpose this. It, it's still a, it's still an Orthodox shul, but they want to make it also some kind of a center, a cultural center, and museum as well. And uh, it's well worth visiting. Uh, I also have a recorded lecture online about the history and the art of this building. But I just want you to see the sky here. Uh, but you'll see the curtains in the back too, which we'll come back to. Really a stupendous sky. This is a little bit earlier than ours in Minneapolis. This is probably uh, from the mid, uh, early to mid twenties. The building's a little bit earlier, but the decorations probably from then. Okay, and here again, I want you to see the sunburst and you see it a little bit better, the faint lines which have been overpainted, but you can see them under the blue as well. Uh, there was more decoration on this arc when it was the synagogue, there were carved lions uh, on the top of the ark. And then right here, you can still see the Jewish star, the, the, the Magen David is there. I don't know if you can see it. I can see it here on my screen. And then the 10 commandments were under, underneath. Um, but otherwise, um, the front of the building is probably not unlike it was. Uh, and maybe Bob Wolf, who's here, he remembers, he said he was bar mitzvah here. So maybe he remembers what the front of the building looks like, looked like. Um, Back, back at that time. No, no, okay. Um, so here's just a detail of that same uh, view. And while we're looking at it, I want you to see the faux architecture or fictive architecture because we're gonna look at that next. And uh, you can see how the curtain, very beautifully done. This is a trained artist or trained decorator artist. Uh, they're able to make that, make that curtain uh, loop over the architecture and then up to the sunburst, which would have been here. Uh, you can see that the architecture was painted first and then the curtain was painted over it uh, on both sides, but probably all part of the same program. And this is the Burlington mural before it was restored. Uh, actually, it's in the process of being tested. So some of the colors are brighter than others. Um, but here you can see there's a sunburst very similar to our example. And of course, more elaborate curtains uh, and columns. This is a real uh, combination representation of the tabernacle, of the, that is the Mishkan, uh, the, the, the holy place in the desert. And then also with um, the tents of Jacob, the whole tent imagery is very strong there. Uh, this example has the lions and the uh, Ten Commandments painted, uh, not, not sculpted, but the, the general arrangement is very similar. Uh, looking at Chelsea again, there's not a sunburst, but at the edge where the ceiling hits the arc wall, uh, you see this faux architecture, illusionistic architecture, what we call trump loy, trick the eye. And um, the sun is just rising. It's just coming up over the horizon. And then we have these very exotic peacocks. Uh, they, may, they remind us of the, of the parrot that we saw in Lviv. Uh, I, I, I don't know if these peacocks have particular symbolic meaning or not. Peacocks uh, have a lot of different meaning in a lot of different cultures, and, but they're not that, they're often represented in Judaism, but there isn't a particular value assigned. Okay, so let's look at the architecture very quickly. Um, why do you have painted architecture? Well, it's cheaper than the real thing. So this is just a brick building. Essentially, it's a box, a brick box. Um, I think it's all masonry, um, but maybe the people of the building would know whether it has steel, steel support. I don't think so. It's all load-bearing masonry, and uh, it would have had a wooden roof. Um, so they made it look a little more elegant, a little more classical, a little fancy by painting fluted pilasters uh, that's what we call these strips along the wall and, and, a, and a molding all along the top. And the molding is quite cleverly done. Uh, it's meant to fool the eye and look three-dimensional. Um, in looking through my pictures, and I think we noticed this when we looked at the building in December, but um, it's clear that there were probably more than one uh, campaigns of decoration. This looks like uh, this uh, molding with the flower and the kind of oval, uh, I don't know, I can't describe that shape, it's too complex, um, but it seems to underlie this uh, pilaster with a different type of decoration in the capital. 
that seems to be painted over. Um, and whether it was done intentionally just to suggest that the, this element is different from that, or whether this was done first and then they decided to add the pilasters after, uh, hard to know, hard to know. But probably painted within a fairly short time. These decisions, we know the building was first built in 26. There was a fire, was painted in, after 32. There might have been some additional touch-ups or changes, uh, you know, as as in 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 the intervening years. But they left in 57, so the period for change is pretty short, and generally very little of this type of work was done anywhere uh, during World War II. So it was probably all from the 1930s. Uh, here you see the uh, classical uh, detailing here. This is all flat paint. This is all two-dimensional, but it's painted to look three-dimensional. So pretty good, pretty good quality there. Someone had some training. Um, this type of fictive architecture is really common. And we find it in Jewish buildings and other buildings too throughout history when they didn't have, couldn't afford the car, carved stonework or even uh, molded stucco. Uh, so this is just an example from uh, Lithuania uh, of a similar capital. This one is from the uh, Walnut Street Shoal in Chelsea that we already saw. Uh, so we see that there's a, a continuity. Uh, this is the Vilna Shoal, a, a 1919 uh, immigrant synagogue in Beacon Hill in uh, Boston on Phillips Street. It, this wall has been restored. It was in much worse condition when I first saw it 30 years ago. Uh, but I just want to point out the fictive architecture. There's a colonnade, and this is the back of the women's section. Um, some synagogues do have these scenes from the Holy Land, which became very popular in the early part of the 20th century. They circulated on postcards from Eretz Yisrael, from the land of Israel, on calendars and almanacs and as prints and even as photographs. So um, they were easy to create and they often adorn uh, these immigrant synagogues. Now this is an unusual piece in uh, the former Tiferet B'nai Jacob. Uh, these are the sunburst uh, stencils. You saw, I've seen some pictures outside. Um, I don't know of any exact parallels to this in a synagogue. There are often stenciled panels or carved panels. Uh, seemingly entirely decorative, often vegetal. Um, these are similar, except in the center, they have that sunburst. And as I mentioned, the sun also has a certain great meaning in Judaism, but it could have been a pattern that was just borrowed from someplace else. And they decided to apply it, that it would be inoffensive and, and look pretty. Uh, we have no testimony, so it's all guesswork. It's just all the guesswork. Um, that's what that's the fun of it, but it's also the uncertainty. Uh, we do have this one photograph. This is a really valuable photograph. Any people go through your, uh, whether you're Jews or Christians, go through your your family albums and look for look for ceremony, pictures of ceremonies or other events in old houses of worship because it is so hard to get the details right unless you have those photographs. And of course, a photograph from the 50s is gonna be different from the 40s and 30s because there's always change. So sometimes these photographs really help us to nail things down. Okay. Um, and here you see those lions that were mentioned on top of the, on top of the arc. I'm not watching time, so I, somebody should give me a <laughs> signal when we have you know, some time to go. Okay, so I wanna look at on top of the arc are these wonderful vases with flowers. These are some of the most beautiful elements um, and some of the most accomplished, uh, most painterly elements. Uh, there are two of these vases with flowers and then there are two urns. And there's some great photos of them out in the exhibition. They really, you know, the, the artist has, knows how to do shadowing and modeling and really present them as three-dimensional. They clearly taken some classes at a museum or in an art school looking at the old masters. Um, and uh, it, you know, it, gives, it gives the, uh, the place a bit of class. In, and, and, I think, and I think the Jews who were there, uh, who were not so classy, most of them, uh, they, they probably would have been uh, appreciative. Maybe some of them would have been a bit amused or skeptical. Um, but you know, it, it, it's, an, it's an unusual touch, but one sh that's very intentional. 
And that's what we have to remember. Somebody wanted to make something of, of beauty and, uh, uh, and note. Okay, the curtains we saw before, we've seen lots of instances. This is a tradition that goes back very far in Christian art and seems to get picked up in Jewish art by the 16th, 17th century. Um, very common to see saints behind revealed uh, behind curtains, particularly the Madonna and child. Often curtains are parted and there they are. Are they really there? Is it an apparition like in the theater? We don't know. We often see portraits of royalty and other important dignitaries behind uh, revealed by curtains. So clearly curtains are a way of denoting something of importance and maybe even something of, of uh, a person or a thing of, 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 of royalty and of power. Um, these are Italian examples from the uh, thir uh, 14, early 14th and, and uh, 15th century. Um, and here we have a Jewish example uh, a painted, a very simple wooden painted synagogue from Germany that just by accident survives. It's in the Israel Museum today. You see the curtains um, uh, from the 17th century. And here, um, actually, the, the ark is right underneath. So the curtains are, instead of over the Virgin Mary or over a queen or a king, they're over the, the most important, most powerful, most holy, most <coughs> ruling element in Jewish life, which is the Torah itself. Um, more examples from the, from the Czech Republic, from Poland, these are from the 18th century. Uh, these are from uh, the 18th and 19th century, from Poland and Romania. So just, I want you to see, these are very common. The curtain is a normal element. And so the, the painters here um, in Minneapolis knew this from experience. Uh, they would, but they don't find it in any book. I don't know of a single book on architecture or art, Jewish or otherwise, that talks about curtains behind the ark. So it's just people knew it. This was something you did when you made the ark wall, you had a, a curtain behind the ark. But it also suggests that a lot of these people were theater painters because this one, for instance, in Toronto, Knesset, Israel, which is one of the most beautiful, really looks like a theater curtain with, this, with the ropes, um, and then instead of just showing you uh, a blank wall or a, or, a, or a sunburst, what we're seeing is a paradisical scene. Um, and so the idea that if you are at the synagogue, you worship God, you study Torah, which is right under this, this opening, uh, maybe, maybe this is, this is a, a paradisical future. It's my, that's my surmising. Uh, again, nobody's written this, so... It's, it's, it's hard to know. Okay, let's get to the Zodiac, which is the main <coughs> event. And we'll take a look at some of these 12 scenes and how they fit in with Jewish tradition. So somebody before the talk began mentioned that Zodiacs, Zodiacs, that's not very Jewish, is it? Greek. Well, it's not even Greek, it goes back to Babylonia. Um, but the Greeks, the Romans, the Christians, Jews, they've all used the Zodiac. The Zodiac is like, how many of you still wear a wristwatch? Okay, so um, do you need that wristwatch? No, because you, because you look at your phone probably to see what time it is. You can find, uh, but the wristwatch is something that you're used to and it's symbolic of, I don't know what it is, but that we're all old people, not young people. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the point is the Zodiac is kind of like that. The zodiac is a carryover from centuries past, and it represents time, but it's really not always what we consult when we want to know what day it is or what month it is, what season it is, but it's something that's there, and it's part of us, part of our life, part of the culture, and that's the way the zodiac has carried on. Now, it has other meanings, too. People have, you know, get into astrology, and they find all sorts of mystical meanings, and that's a, another 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 use, another level, but I don't think that's at play when Zodiacs are in synagogue decoration. So yes, they are in synagogue decoration from the get-go. We'll come back to this. These are the different signs. Um, so in antiquity, except for Dura Europas, we don't have any synagogues where the walls still survive. So we don't know what was on the walls or what was on the ceilings. I believe the walls had pictures. They were painted and the ceilings were decorated just like later synagogues. 
but all we have are the floors, mosaic floors. And the mosaic floors are all decorated. And many of them, more than half a dozen so far, have big zodiacs right in the center of the floor. Now, is that because the world's turned upside down, the cosmos is on the ground? No, I don't think so, but it is a way of looking at the floor as you walk in, as you gather for prayer, and you think of the cosmic time, the whole cyclical uh, movement of the heavens that God has created, but you're also thinking of the movement of the seasons, which are so important in an agricultural society like ancient Israel, and of the months themselves, uh, which not just dictate things like when it's time to plant and harvest, but also when to celebrate all the Jewish holidays. So the, the, the cycle of time is really important. And in Judaism, it's a wheel of time. It, Judaism isn't you know, the beginning and the end like Christianity is waiting for the second coming. Judaism is a cyclical, cyclical uh, religion. And we, we always think the past is part of the present. Those of you who celebrate Passover and have been to a Passover Seder recently would know that you know, you, you're reenacting year after year, but it's not just a reenactment, it's actually a, um, a, a full uh, being there, full engagement. Um, and, and that's the way Jewish time uh, kind of works when it's at, at, its, at its best. So we have all of these examples, and you'll see all of these have Hebrew lettering uh, and these are the months. So the zodiac signs, even though they look like little classical figures, nudes, uh, which you might not expect to see in a synagogue, nude figures and, and, and centaurs and, and other mythical beasts, um, the, the, they all correspond not to a pagan a calendar, but to the Jewish calendar, to the months given in Hebrew. So this is one from the sixth century, very well known, Beit Elf on the left, but this is a 18th century wheel, similar uh, in, a, in a book uh, that is full of prayers for different occasions. This is the blessing for the new moon. And here you have the zodiac symbols uh, around this wheel as well. The only real difference is that the, some of the figures are dressed up in more 18th century costume like Virgo here, um, but we still have Gemini, the twins, and and we have Sagittarius, the archer, and, and, and so on. Uh, this is a wedding contract from Italy from the 18th century. Uh, it has the zodiac signs all around the top, which you'll see here. They're very simple, little, they look like signet rings or seals that were very common in, in, for, for, for pressing on letters, wax seals or denoting ownership or authority. Um, they, are, they are symbols, that's what they are. They're not narratives, they are symbols and they're taken from some other context and they're meant to represent that, not so much the zodiacal sign, but the month uh, that, that's, that it represents. In the same way, the menorah up here represents something and the crown represents something. They all have different, uh, the showbread table, they all have deeper meanings that an educated person would know. This is a, a prayer book from the 18th century uh, with a prayer uh, in praise of dew. Uh, and again, you see similar signs and here they're being printed. So once they are printed in books, they begin to disseminate even widely, more widely. Doesn't, you don't just have to be in the synagogue and know it from the ceiling or to see that one wedding contract, which was hand painted, but now everybody can look at these books and, and, and learn what's going on. Um, one of the great painted ceilings from, from um, the Jewish past was in Gvurjits, uh, which is a town in Ukraine now. Uh, the synagogue has been destroyed, but it was well documented in the interwar years, so we have a lot of uh, images, mostly in black and white. And I just want to point out, Botoshani, Botoshani, I don't know how you actually pronounce it, Botoshani in Romania that we looked at from where this community has its roots, it's not far, it's right here, right in that little bump in Romania there. So this part of the world was very rich in, in synagogue decoration for a long, long time. I think Marilyn will probably mention that tomorrow. Uh, so we have documentation of what the synagogue looked like before its destruction. And this cupola from the 17th century was extravagantly painted. And there's a row of uh, 12 zodiac signs at the top of the cupola. We also see that these synagogues were filled with 
other types of decoration, much of which has been lost. We have some at Boscovice painted, but these were prayers. These are prayer on the walls. The, the, the synagogue itself was a prayer book. So people didn't have to own a prayer book. They could, they could read the prayers when they came on their own. Um, this synagogue was destroyed, but as many of you probably know, uh, in 2014, it, a replica, an 85% size replica was installed at the new Poland Museum in Warsaw. And uh, this is the closest you can get today to experiencing a full um, uh, painted wooden ceiling, probably with its original vibrant colors, which of course would fade over time. And this was, uh, there's a great movie about this called Raise the Roof, which I urge you all to, to watch. And that will give you some sense of the, of the um, recreation. And here are some of those zodiac signs. This is Virgo here. You'll see it just, just uh, an arm. And you'll see there are no human figures in this, in this representation, just arms. Here we have, it's hard to see, but this is Aquarius. Instead of a water carrier, there's just a picture of a well. Uh, this is a photo I took in 1990. I didn't even know what I was taking because the synagogue was dark and boarded up, but I used my flash. And when I got home to America, I looked at the pictures and I found, oh, look, there's a Zodiac in this old synagogue of Kmelnik in Poland, which has since been restored. Here you see very similar um, representations. These are probably from the 1920s, but very similar in form to those from uh, Gvorgitz uh, from the 17th century. And increasingly, we're getting more and more examples uh, as investigators are uncovering uh, lost synagogues, recovering um, images. Uh, this is in Ukraine, uh, Novoselitsa. Uh, and this was discovered just in 2009, and it's been fully documented. You can find all these photos on the webpage of the Center for Jewish Art. And here in the ceiling, there's this very complex uh, design of interlocking triangles, not quite Jewish stars, but in the um, triangles around the edge, that's where the zodiac signs are. But they're not the most important images in the whole decoration because they're these scenes around the edge represent all of the prophets and their different books of the Bible. There's a lot of other imagery at play here. Okay, so that brings us back to Minneapolis. These are the these are the uh, images as you probably know: Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and so on. And this is the arrangement that we find them going from right to left uh, in the synagogue. Uh, and that's the arrangement beginning probably September, October, Libra, and then working their way through the year. Right now, we're at the end. We're in, uh, no, no, we are in ER, I think. I think we're in ER, uh, which is the sign of the bull. So I'm just gonna show you, uh, take a look at John's photos outside. They, the prints that he was able to do, they, they, it makes them look like paintings. They're, it's really extraordinary. And, uh, but I'm gonna throw in a few comparisons, roughly contemporary. So this is, this is Libra here in our synagogue church. Um, typical scales, but a wonderful uh, ocean uh, scene here or lake scene, I, uh, very unusual. Um, and then this is Libra from Sons of Jacob in Providence, a very modern take, two little kids on a seesaw. And that's Libra. Uh, Scorpio, Sagittarius. So we have no problem in this Orthodox shul in Orthodox synagogue uh, on Elmwood uh, in having human figures or mythological figures. Uh, here's another from Sons of Jacob. Nope, they have no problem either. Others will, will just show uh, 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 an arrow. And here we have the wonderful uh, Capricorn. That's uh, my, my sign. Here's the well, the water carrier. So it's interesting, um, often in antiquity, you just have uh, a nude figure carrying a big pot of water. And here, and then in, in early Jewish iconography, they replace that with a well sometimes with the 
mechanical arm for pulling up the water. This does both. It's not a nude figure, but it has a full figure, a woman and, um, and the well. In Jewish context, of course, we think of Rebecca uh, at the well. Uh, so it it's, um, has, has some, some significance. Or, or, we, or we think of uh, Moses when he goes and, and uh, waters the flocks of Zipporah in, in Exodus. The, the Pisces, the, uh, the fish for the month of Adar. And here's a, 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 a different example. This is a place I haven't mentioned. This is the Breed, Sheet, Breed Street Shul in Los Angeles, uh, which is in a ruinous state. It's undergoing a 20 year restoration uh, as it will be a community center. Uh, but some of the Zodiac signs are here. I'm convinced they were done by a, you know, a Disney animator or somebody. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, this is Los Angeles after all, and it's the right time. But these are wonderful uh, images. So on, here we are, this is where we are now, ER. And here are the twins, Gemini. But in other Jewish contexts, we'll see twins represented by birds. Representing humans as birds is a long tradition in Jewish manuscript painting going back to the Middle Ages. I haven't touched on it, but it would be understood by, by pretty much everybody. And a few more, and then just a couple other lions. Lions are ubiquitous in, Jewish art. They're the most frequently represented animals. Uh, lions of Judah, lions in stories with Samson. I mean, they're everywhere. And uh, Ari, the lion, is uh, the sign for the month. And then here is the most beautiful, I think, of all of the figures, this uh, Virgo holding her, her wheat. And um, she also has biblical connotations. It makes us think of stories like Ruth and Naomi and, and other harvest in the harvest holidays. Uh, this is from the Remu synagogue in Krakow. I took this 2018. These were just recently revealed. They were all whitewashed. So um, you can see here the face isn't shown, but it's a woman and more examples. Okay. So let me just finish up because I've been going for a long time. I know that to show you some of the losses we've had recently. Uh, this is a little synagogue in Brooklyn. Uh, I photographed, I was there in 2001 and it was a real wreck. And I said, well, I really wanna come back under other circumstances and document this because I didn't have a good camera with me and j just really, and I think using the, the, the mazoles, these, these signs, it could be um, help them get grants, restoration grants and get on the national register. So they were so excited. So then they told me when I was gonna go the next time, they said, oh, you'll be so excited what we did. We rebuilt that whole section and repainted all those mazolis. So they looked brand new and, and, and they actually had destroyed and everything. Um, this is a synagogue in, whoops, let me go back, in uh, on the Lower East Side uh, that I visited about 25 years ago and just before it was destroyed. And this also had mazolas. I didn't know anything about wall painting then. I didn't know anything about mazolas. And I, and I didn't take the best pictures. I have some pictures and I might show them later. But, um, and then this is a synagogue that still exists and people have been trying to save. And I've written about it a lot. It's the Stanton Street Shoal in the Lower East Side. But uh, some energetic community members have taken it upon themselves to touch up the paintings and fix them because they think they needed uh, not to be conserved, but to be repainted. And I, I will say that that is a, a Jewish tradition to repaint the walls. So I can't be entirely um, disappointed, but uh, for the historical, um, you know, loss is considerable since those mazolis, I like to think they were painted by, you know, not my great grandparents or great, great grandparents, but of that generation, the immigrants who came over. And this was, this was a loss, this is a lost, connection with them. <laughs> That's Scorpio, <laughs> looks like a tarantula. <laughs> yeah, and th this, is, this is the uh, uh, Mazzoli's when I, the way they looked at first, and then these were my bad pictures that I took in 2012, and then they redid it, redid them all. And uh, you can see they, they tore down the walls, parapet walls, and then repainted them all new. So that's a loss. 
Um, and these are the ones that were lost in that other building. You can see they're all in that tradition. Uh, we don't know what the sources for these were. Um, maybe there were some handbooks, just calendars, they're prints that go around. Um, they're so generic. Uh, obviously, there was a tradition that was easy to uh, transmit. The ones here in Minneapolis, of course, are of a different quality, different level. They are, they are much more artistic and they're drawing much more on academic and classically inspired sources. Uh, so they might be looking at signs from non-Jewish sources. Uh, they might be invented. Uh, we don't have any exact Jewish parallels yet uh, for the images. I think we'll hear a little bit more about them uh, tomorrow as well. And then I just want to end with another church. So this is uh, Green Pastures Baptist Church in um, Green Pastures Baptist Church in Brooklyn, and uh, it looks in terrible condition because it had been hit by Hurricane Sandy, and they pretty much lost their roof. There was a lot of water damage, and they've been uh, putting together a restoration plan for the building for a number of years. Uh, so something totally different, but think of that temple. This is a 1930s temple. Looks like it's out of Hollywood, probably. Um, but maybe, ah, I didn't want to include these. Sorry, this is, let's skip through these. There we go. Okay, there we go. And that takes us back to, to um, our church, First Church of God in Christ here in Minneapolis. So thanks for your patience. Um, and I hope that was a whirlwind a lesson in art that you had never seen or never heard of before for most of you. And, um, I, think, I, I, think, I think the Minneapolis example will take its place in this, in this very select narrative. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. That was fabulous. We've all been sitting here for, for quite a while. I know my back is a little sore. Um, <laughs> do, I know, do we, it, well, it's been an hour and I'm, I'm not sure if we wanna do questions now or if we should just na uh, sort of nab you in the, in the um, uh, reception. Is it, is it matter? I think we're ready for a reception now or do we have a quick question? How about if you let people go? Yeah. That's a good idea. We do have a quick question back there. Go ahead. We haven't heard who the architect or the builder of this who, building is. Who the architect or the builder of this building? The architect was Perry Crozier, C R O S I E R. He did other theaters in uh, the Twin Cities, particularly apartment buildings as well. Um, the builder? The contractor is no, but I, I can't. It's not on the tip of my tongue. So we, we do know who it is. Yeah. Sorry, we don't know who the we're the the we do know who the builder is, but we can't remember. <laughs> it wasn't you know Van, it wasn't Van Delt. You know, I just don't remember. We do know that Labor Liebenberg and Kaplan played a major role after the 32 fire. Probably use the mic. Okay. We've got a question here and then we'll get to the back. In that image, the stairs are very prominent part of it, but I've seen original or early images and this, they were different. Is there a story about that where they just needed to be replaced or these are simpler? Yeah, the, the original stairway, it gets a split stairway and then it comes up. I don't think we have any information on why it was changed. Access. So uh, you've spoken about the artists and artisans, but I was under the impression that uh, many of them were not Jewish. Am I wrong about that? And okay, we'll hear about it tomorrow. I will say, in, in most of what I show you, uh, I think quality uh, artists and artisans. Uh, the artists are Jewish, but they're not Jewish. Almost all the artists were Jewish. The old, the old buildings uh, from antiquity to like Beit Alpha, the mosaics, all the way through Boscovice and Gorgitz, they're all signed by the artists. We know their names and they are Jews. Um, and they were well regarded. And the painters in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, they had workshops and they traveled around 
from town to town and decorated synagogues. But even the Wilshire Boulevard synagogue was painted by a Jewish artist, Hugo Balin. Um, and he was a, a also decorated the, the, the Griffin Observatory. So if you've seen La La Land, you've seen his, his uh, murals there and many other things. Um, so there weren't a lot of Jews at, trained as artists because they weren't allowed into art academies in more recent times until the early 19th century. And they weren't allowed into guilds, um, art guilds usually in the Middle Ages and later. But within the Jewish community, there were traditions of, of this type of folkish folk art or, or traditional, uh, a traditional art. Uh, but it is a, it's a very good question because it's one that people keep, keep asking. Now the architects, it's a more difficult question for architects. Uh, and we assume most of the buildings, synagogue buildings before the 19th century, the late 19th century, were built by non-Jews. I've got a question way in the back here. Uh, you mentioned whitewashing. How did they remove the whitewash and uh, preserve the paint and the artwork underneath? Uh, well, um, I'm not a conservator, but I was involved in that project. Uh, it, it's not hard. This is not a latex. This is this is not uh, like an oil paint or a. It's it's a very thin lime and water mix. So you can actually almost brush it off with a brush. And if the fresco underneath is durable, but they use softer methods, a, a little bit of uh, different types of water and can you and 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 brushes and 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 I'm, uh, it, it can be done. It's not, it's not not a difficult task um, when it's intentionally painted over, like um, you know in the American cases, uh, they're using you know denser denser paints. It's it's a, it's a more difficult difficult process, and often it can still be done in the Vilnius show they in Boston. They've been stripping off paint to reveal what's underneath, uh, but it's but it's much more laborious. Thank you. And let's take one more and then we'll, we'll take break. Thanks very much. I think locally it wasn't until about the middle 1940s, early 1950s before we had any prominent Jewish architects in the Twin Cities. Am I wrong about that? And the question I'm not hearing you even from this close. Yeah. Really the there was a very famous architectural team in Minneapolis, Jack Liedenberg and Kaplan, and they designed, among other things, the Adasa Shirn, the one on DuPont, the Temple Israel on Hennepin, the former Bethel that was on Penn Avenue, and almost every Art Deco movie theater in the upper Midwest. <laughs> but they were a very prominent uh, architectural firm. Thank you. So a little bit earlier than I was thinking. My question is about the synagogue in Ukraine. Has that survived the warring and the bombing? Uh, as far as I know, all the Jewish um, sites, uh, significant Jewish sites, have so far survived unharmed in Ukraine. Most of them are in Western Ukraine, and most of the bombing of Western Ukrainian targets and cities, initially it was at military targets, then there was indiscriminate bombing, but nothing, I didn't hear of any of the Jewish sites. Uh, uh, hurt. In fact, they're not, I mean, the truth of the matter is so many of the Jewish sites were destroyed, you know, during the Holocaust that there's not a lot left in most, most places. And those places that have survived, uh, have survived because they're very remote and small villages and whatnot, which are not getting bombed. In the early days, there were a few reported uh, uh, incidents where it was said that the Babi Yar site was hit and destroyed. That was false. 
uh, they were aiming at a television tower and maybe a shell hit nearby, but nothing of the memorial was destroyed or anything in the gorge where the massacres took place. And there was one Holocaust memorial, a modern Holocaust memorial in Kharkiv, which was damaged, uh, a big menorah, which was hit. Uh, I don't know whether it was hit directly or from some kind of, uh, you know, uh, recoil or something. And then uh, I, I heard of a sh one shell uh, fell in a cemetery, I think. So there may have been a small amount of damage. Um, so in part because so much has been lost before, um, you know, it's not there to be destroyed today. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Any others? I think we're ready. So please join us for a reception out in the gallery area and please join us tomorrow. Uh, we'll start about 9, 9.15. 9 uh, Marilyn Chiat is going to give a talk. The Bishop Thuston is going to give a talk. There'll be uh, lunch provided, box lunch provided. And then in the afternoon, we'll have our community round table to have a conversation about these things. So thank you. And please join us out in the gallery for reception.